Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise you, for he is your health and salvation. Let all who hear now to his temple draw Good morning, people of St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Wilmington, Delaware, and anyone who may be joining us in this virtual capacity. We're glad to have you, by the way. I hope that this uh, virtual service finds you uh, well and whole and hopeful. Uh, we are people of hope. We hope not only for the resolution and uh, abatement of a virus and other conflicts that we may be experiencing on this earth, but we hope for eternal life, which has been promised us in Christ Jesus. So we hope that's the case for you. A couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, you may have missed uh, this last Wednesday a, uh, a midweek uh, offering. Uh, I've been away, and so that didn't happen. <clears throat> uh, we will anticipate on the um, 20th, I believe it is, or the 19th of August, uh, Pastor Clarence Pettit, uh, co-pastor at Unity Lutheran Church, the Amalgamum of Zion, the oldest Lutheran church in town, and Spirit of Life Lutheran Church, which was a church primarily for people of color. So they've emerged. And, and Clarence and I have known each other for decades, and maybe some of you have known Clarence as well. So uh, we're going to have a little conversation uh, the, that Wednesday. And the following Wednesday, uh, Rob Gurney, the executive director of Luther Community Services, will be with us. I believe that's uh, right around the 1st or the 2nd of September. So we will be offering these things most weeks. Same also with uh, Sunday mornings now on uh, whatever the fourth Sunday in August may happen to be. Pastor Barbara Maloche, she's the conference dean will be uh, filling in for me, although I'll be here. There are those of our members who have asked that uh, we have a guest uh, woman pastor every now and then. Uh, 
remembering that St. Mark's was the first congregation, Lutheran congregation in town here to have a, an associate woman pastor in the person of uh, Jane Shields. I remember Jane. We worked together closely. So Barbara's going to be with us on that fourth Sunday in August, and I'll be here with her too. There are other things going on. Read your newsletter, The Lion, and wait for communications of various kinds, especially as we expect to open up on September 6th. You will receive uh, an email and some written instructions as to how it is we're going to function here. I believe you will find them safe uh, and intelligent so that we can worship uh, other than in fear. So that said, we begin as we believe in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Last week, I shared with you that uh, Lee, Roy, and Larry, and Lenny were all gone. Lee, Roy, and Larry were off in the hills somewhere enjoying the outside. Uh, that's what animals do. They don't want to be cramped up inside or in a cage or something like that. They like to be able to roam free. And they must have loved lo roaming free because they're not yet back. But Lenny was off visiting his grandmother, and he's back with us. And he had such a wonderful time with his grandma. And most of us, especially since we're stuck in these days, and may not have occasion because of the virus to literally hug grandma or see grandma up close or grandpa or somebody else who's very important to you, uh, we need to recognize that uh, one day, again, sometime, we're going to be able to do that, we hope. In the meantime, wearing a mask and keeping some distance uh, from other people in your life is very important. So that, uh, sometime soon, hopefully soon, uh, we will have a chance to visit the people that matter to us, just like Lenny visited his grandma. And again, he has all kinds of wonderful stories about his, his grandma. His grandfather is no longer uh, alive. So, Lenny, uh, you enjoyed your time. Yes, you did. Okay. Uh, next week, uh, we'll be back and see uh, if Larry and Leroy are back from their roaming in the mountains. Uh, we certainly hope they were safe out there, because if they weren't back, we would really miss them. So, see you next time. Bye. Today's first reading is from the 56th chapter of Isaiah, beginning with the first verse. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. And the foreigners who join them to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, 
all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from the 11th chapter of Romans, beginning with the first verse. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they now have been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. Here ends the second reading. Today's gospel is from the 15th chapter of Matthew, beginning with the 10th verse. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth and enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart? And this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, idolatry, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Here ends the gospel. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In the midst of any personal difficulties or needs of any kind, as well as in the midst of difficulties or needs we are all experiencing right now, it is essential that we hold tight to the promises of God. We must acknowledge and learn to appreciate that God will fulfill his promises in his own way and at his own pace. God is our heavenly Father. Listen to this from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11. Is there anyone among you, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if a child asks for a fish, will give a, a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, 
how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? The relationship which has been established between God and a person or persons allows us to trust God, to believe God has our best interests in mind and heart, and will in his time and way act. Try to relax and be patient. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him and he will act. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's from one of my favorite psalms, that is 37, verses 5 and 7a. As shared a few weeks ago, when speaking of prayer based on Romans 8, we read in verse 28, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God. It may take a good while, but the good will come. In the meantime, don't stop loving God. God has not stopped loving you. A word that has significance in both testaments is covenant. There is the Noahic covenant in which God promised never again to destroy the earth with a flood. The Abrahamic covenant where God promised uh, Abraham to make him the father of many nations. There is the Davidic covenant and a host of others, each having God's assurance of one promise or another. In our baptisms, God calls us by name, makes us his own in Jesus Christ, and promised never to leave us nor to forsake us. Baptism is such a wonderfully simple act with the basic substance of water and the spiritual promise of God's word. It is a sad reality that so many of the baptized forget or forsake that rebirth. Let us pray. Lord, renew us in our appreciation of and belief in your promises. Sealed in the blood of Jesus, serviced in the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us for in any way treating lightly or casually this eternal hope. In Jesus' name, amen. On what basis are you a Christian? Hopefully we all know it is not on the basis of our behavior. It's simply too imperfect. Hopefully we all celebrate that becoming and remaining a Christian is purely on account of God's amazing grace. Hopefully deep within our hearts we have faith, that is confidence, in, God's precisely, in God precisely because of Jesus. On what basis was an Israelite an Israelite? Did a bunch of tribal people out of the blue, out in the desert one day, decide to call upon God to save them? Hardly. God decided to call them and mold them into his chosen people, as resistant and hesitant and intransigent as they tended to be all along the way. The covenant was sealed for the male children in the act of circumcision. The male children were eight days old, not quite yet of an age of personal decision. God decided. And we must add here that when it comes to baptism, boys and girls, male and female, are eligible. It's not just for men anymore, or males anymore. Somewhere along the line, did God decide to forsake his promises to the Israelites, later known as the Jews? Had God finally had it with them after sending prophet after prophet, blessing after blessing? Perhaps it was not until most of them rejected Jesus as the Messiah. Unbelievably, there, there are those who count the Holocaust as punishment for killing the Christ. Articulating this nauseates me. The point is that we human beings, Jews and Gentiles alike, forsake our part of the covenant God has in some form or another made with us. But God never forsakes his part. If God does, we're all in very deep trouble. I want you to hear like you've heard nothing from me in the past or possibly nothing from me in the future. Romans chapter 11, in which we are finding ourselves right now, verse 29. For the gifts 
and the call of God are irrevocable. For the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Earlier, before writing this incredible statement, Paul, about his Israelite family, wrote this, quote, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Romans 11, 2. If God is given to the breaking of promises, what do we have left in our relationship with God? If God had finally had it with the Jews for whatever reason, what is to keep God from forsaking us when we so consistently fail in doing our part? When I read the Hebrew scriptures, I am inevitably struck by the vivid contrast between the unfaithful behavior of the Jews and the constant grace of of God. Listen to Isaiah the prophet, chapter 63, verse 7. I will recount the gracious deeds of the Lord, the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, because of all that the Lord has done for us, and the great favor to the house of Israel that he has shown them according to his mercy, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Listen again to David the psalmist, Psalm 92, verses 1 and 2. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing your praises, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. There are dozens of psalm verses which say the same. Listen to Jeremiah in Lamentations, a book seldom quoted, chapter 3, verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. In Romans 11, verses 13, or 30 to 31, Paul makes a fascinating claim, namely that the disobedience of the Jews occasions the broadening of God's mercy to include us. It is as if to say that had the Jews done their righteous and obedient part, and believed in Jesus for that matter, we might not have gained access to God's grace, mercy, and love. That's the way he puts it. He wants us to think in those terms for a while so that we might not dismiss or write off the Jews because God has kept his part even when they haven't kept theirs. Anyone, Jew or Gentile, then or now, or in between, who takes God's grace and twists and abuses or uses it as an excuse to behave as we please, has not known the depth, the height, the breadth of God's grace to begin with. Just because God is as God is, that is tenacious in his love of humanity, does not give humanity an excuse to hate, hurt, or harm others because we will be forgiven anyway. At the same time, when we fail or fall short of God's glory, what we trust is not our capacity to make amends, but God's promise to forgive in Christ. In my ministry, there have been plenty of times, numerous times, when the only resource I had was God's grace toward me and toward whoever I was ministering to, especially in the midst of great tragedy or grievous sin. God is so gracious tenacious, loving, merciful, and good, that what we can and must do is depend upon God and rejoice in his name. Especially in our day, there remains a profound issue which is extremely important to me. That is the condition and fate of the Palestinian people. Just as Paul did not trade hates when he became a Christian, he still loved the Jews and stopped hating the Christians, began loving them as one of them. So also, I need not cross borders and take a side as I have become committed to justice for the Palestinian people. Technically, the Delaware Churches for Middle Eastern Peace and its national counterpart stand as neutral in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I participate and support that organization. 
There are all sorts and kinds of tensions and conflicts all over the world. At least 40, they say, skirmishes going on at any given time. Some are relatively minor, others are major and deadly. But none is seemingly as complex and significant as in the Israeli-Palestinian question. It tends to be that as things go in the Middle East, so goes the world. I've often said that if someone eats garlic in Israel-Palestine, the world burps. It is a geopolitical nightmare for which there is no easy solution. I once heard in a national Jewish Christian conference from a Jewish scholar and rabbi that if Jews here and over there disagree, sometimes profoundly, about the policies of the government of Israel, we Americans and others are free to disagree as well. After all, we disagree sometimes with the policies of our own government. Why should we have to agree all the time with the policies of another? It would be difficult to call uh, Israeli policies toward the Palestinian people, anything other than oppressive. While I have political concerns here, there is an even greater issue for me. The Christian population in Palestine between 1948 and the establishment of the modern state of Israel and the present has nosedived from about 17% to less than 1%. I genuinely and passionately believe that there must remain as strong a Christian witness there as anywhere else on earth. Mrs. Mueller and I have two goddaughters there who with their parents are Arab Israelis, that is, Arab citizens in the Jewish state. They matter to us, as do other Palestinians we know and care about, even as we know and care about Jews there as well. I could go on. But allow me to finish by suggesting that a resolution to this problem is as God-sized as any other issue on the earth. If you believe that, then please remember with me the Jews and the Palestinians in your prayers. I might say the Israelis and the Palestinians more appropriately. Pray for them. Pay attention to our American political positions toward peace there. And allow the Lord to use you in whatever way as agents of that peace. That is, I so very strongly believe, as Jesus would have it. A lot of these things may take forever to get resolved, and I mean forever in its best sense. We believe in eternal life. And hopefully, then there will be all those resolutions of these problems. But in the meantime, as Christian people forgiven and loved by God, we cannot hate, and we can learn to love even more People like the Israelis and the Palestinians, the Iraqis, the Iranians, the North Koreans, we are never to stop loving them. That's our Christian duty. Our duty as citizens may be a little different, but hopefully not that far apart. In the name of Jesus, amen. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one community of love throughout the whole wide earth.
let us pray. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, our rock, you are our foundation in Jesus Christ, your Son, whom we confess as the living God. Prepare your church for its mission in bearing witness to Christ, both here at home and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call forth praises from the far reaches of the universe to the smallest of creatures. Join our songs to theirs, that a spirit of praise and thanksgiving will arouse us to cherish this wondrous home you give us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. Direct the leaders of countries, legislators and magistrates, mayors and councils to walk in your ways. Help leaders regard those in needs with mercy and fulfill your loving purposes in the governance of people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve us, deliver us, and fulfill your purpose for us. According to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to those who are bereaved in trouble or adversity or sick and in need of care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amazing and gracious God, far too many people around the earth are suffering and dying because of a virus, although there is no acceptable number. Grant grace and wisdom to your gifts of medical science that they may soon discover a vaccine. Loving Lord, keep safe and sustained all the people who are serving humanity in any and every way these days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call us, St. Mark's, into this community into which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and in one another the unique gifts you have given us for the building up of the church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the privacy of this moment and in the silence of our hearts, we bring to you, O oh Lord, our personal prayer. You are the everlasting rock from which we were hewn, and you restore your people to joy and gladness. In blessed memory and hope, we thank you for the lives of our beloved dead. Bring us with them to our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Especially since these last several weeks, uh, we have been in Romans 9 through 11, which I have shared early on, is Paul's commentary on his Jewish people. Especially since we've been there, I have used on occasion here Psalm 20 as a benediction. I will use it today for the last time in a while. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation in the name of our God. We will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Do have a healthy, to, to a large extent happy, and hopefully also a holy week.
Amen.